And welcome to the Doctor Tech Show, uh, where myself and Swain Hunter will be guiding you to the world of online communications. Uh, welcome, Swain. How's the weather where you are? It's horrible. There's only one word for it. It's soaking wet, grey, can't see further than 50 yards. It's horrible. Mm -hmm. In Birmingham, it is, I can see sky, but I'm not sure it's any kind of uh, light, but it's, it's not dark, so that's good. And rain, probably, but we were out for a nice walk this morning, so we managed to miss that. And let's invite our special guest, Ruth Lee, to come and say how what the weather is like where she is. Ruth, how's the weather where you are? Uh, it's uh, pretty wet. Um, we're, we're, we're on our Scottish October holidays. So. We're, we're hanging, uh, but we're beside a beautiful beach and it's going to be dry in an hour. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, we'll come back to you in a few minutes then. Okay, and so uh, this morning we are, um, this week in fact, we're celebrating National Hate Crime Awareness Week, which is from the 10th to 17th of October. And uh, for those of you who don't know, and probably most of you do, but just it's a good a reminder, hate crimes are any crimes that are targeted at a person because of hostility or prejudice, towards that person's disability, race or ethnicity, religion or belief, sexual orientation or transgender identity. And the crimes can be committed against a person or property. A uh, victim doesn't have to be a member of the group at which the hostility is targeted. In fact, anyone can be a victim of a hate crime. So we hope that doesn't happen to you. And we hope that you, if you, if that does happen to you, that you feel able to report it. One of the things obviously for a program like this is we're concerned with the internet and internet safety tips. So we've got some from True Vision, which is an online reporting site run by the police in England, Wales, and Northern Ireland. Um, other agencies such as the Citizen Advice, Community Voluntary Services, etc., can also report incidents on your behalf. But some tips are to remember to use common sense. It's easy to get swept up into a fantasy world, but reality requires us to use caution. Do not give out personal details, photographs, or any other information that could be used to identify you, your family, or where you live. Don't take other people at face value. They may not be what they seem. Never arrange to meet someone you've only ever previously met on the internet without telling a friend and giving them as much detail as possible about the person that you're meeting and where. Don't open an attachment or download a file unless you know and trust the person who has sent it. And never respond directly to anything you find disturbing when using the internet or email. Log off and report it. So they sound like good, uh, good advice, Wayne. What do you think? Anything to add to that? Yes, very, very good advice. I think that covers most of what you would hope people would be able to, to do. It's very hard when you come up against something that, that is, uh, you know, you feel targeted by. But um, it's good that there's this source of advice available there for people. Absolutely. Yeah. OK, and we're also celebrating this week Digital Leaders Week, uh, which is a, a, a nationwide uh, celebration of leadership in digital. And again, we have we have thoughts about this, but if you're a leader in the UK's digital marketplace for ideas, initiatives and services, uh, if, or if your organisation or place is, then the Digital Leaders Week is for you. They have 350 speakers. And I picked out one session that I thought would might interest um, um, people listening to this programme and others, uh, which is essential digital competencies that everyday citizens need for online participation, which is on Wednesday, the 14th at 10 a.m. And this is a 75 minute interactive workshop for professionals covering essential digital competencies that everyday citizens need for online participation. That's a bit of a mouthful, but um, I think that sounded like one, Swain, that we could encourage people to attend. I'm, I'm thinking of going to it myself because, the, you know, again, as we've said on this program before, we take things, certain things for granted um, about digital and uh, sometimes they're not as, they're not as intuitive as, uh, as we'd like to think so. Absolutely. I have a feeling I've, I've already registered for that one so i better remember to actually turn up <laughs> uh, it's very easy these days to register for online events and then get the email reminding you of it five minutes beforehand you think oh mm. <laughs> can i do that can i can i fit that I in amongst the that. 10 other things yeah. I've, I've, I've said i'll do at that time yeah um but competencies is a good word to have i think because you know people can feel very uh un in, incompetent, I suppose, would be the opposite of that. Yes, I can, um, I can certainly feel incompetent at times. There's no question about that. Um, I'm trying to find this. There's so much stuff in this week. I was trying to find the talk you were you were mentioning. Yeah, it's under, schedule, Gov, but I've given it's under GovTech for some reason. But um, 
yeah, no, I think I think this sounds like one that we could uh, get get some use from. And the final uh, kind of celebration of this week is Birmingham Tech Week, which is obviously a local uh, celebration here. It's our second Tech Week in Birmingham, and I'm, as I'm a non-executive director, I thought I should give it give them a bit of a plug. Oh, it's um, your duty. It's definitely your duty. Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, and there, our strapline is that uh, this week is designed to inspire everyone, celebrate our collective success, and come together in the spirit of collaboration. And for this, we have 150 speakers in 80 sessions. So I think for um, you know, for a city the size of Birmingham, we're pretty proud of that. It's only our second year, as I said, in, in organizing it. So I think it's something for everybody. And as with Digital Leaders Week, all the sessions are free. Um, and you know, it's a, I think it's a kind of a, like going shopping now. Uh, digitally, you can um, you know shop, mix and match, see see what might be of interest to you. I don't think you have to be you know, a professional in any one area to pick out something of interest to this. As, as we recommend with on conferences, you know, go to something that you're not familiar with, find, you know, learn something new, meet, meet some new people. Um, if the sessions are run well and I've no reason to believe they won't be, then, you know, might, might get a chance to meet somebody who would make a difference. So, yeah, so there are three um, uh, celebrations for this week. Um, and um, I'm also uh, happy to be able to share with you news about um, John Popham's funeral, which we um, uh, got information about previously, and we just want to be able to confirm. And it's actually on Friday this week uh, at 11.50 from Huddersfield Crematorium. Um, and John's family have confirmed that the, it will be live streamed, but um, we haven't got the link yet, but it'll be announced on Twitter, etc. cetera. So um, we're sad, obviously, still about John, but happy to... Uh, we carry on his part of his legacy, and we hope that uh, we'll be able to confirm more details, details of that later in the week. So, Swain, who are we meeting today? Today we have Ruth Lee, from who is an occupational therapist. Now, that's a term which we'll come back to to explain, I think, because I think I have a vague idea what it means, but there's a lot to it. Uh, and in our conversations, uh, Ruth has worked... Um, in Orkney and also in the Isle of Man over the years, um, and has a lot of experience in, 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 in providing occupational therapy services. And when it came, when we were looking at specially designed devices to help people uh, who were otherwise isolated, uh, particularly older people, uh, to connect, um, it struck us that maybe the occupational therapy view of, of this stuff would be a useful one. And I immediately thought of Ruth and said, I bet Ruth would come on and speak to us. And here she is. So I'm very pleased to welcome you, Ruth. Maybe you could start with just outlining in a couple of sentences what an occupational therapist actually does and what you aim, how you aim to improve people's lives. OK, so uh, um, an occupational therapist aims to look at every aspect of people's occupations. So I think in Britain, that word tends to be thought of as a word for work, but in fact, occupations are anything you do from brushing your teeth in the morning to um, wanting to chat to friends to play your guitar to go to work to travel so in it so it's a very very broad brush occupational therapy and um, you know we work across the age spectrum and across sort of care sectors so uh, we work with um, we work in mental health settings, in hospitals, in hospices, in GP practices. So it's a fairly broad, um, broad profession with people specialising. That's great. I mean, so it's it's easy for us to get, as you say, hung up on this word occupational and think work, but it's much much mm. broader than that. It's it's to do yeah. with trying to make trying to enable people to make the most of their lives by doing as wide a range of things that they want to do as possible with that be yeah a... yeah and really to focus on what matters to them so it's very much a, a conversational thing where you would try to identify with people what their kind of priorities are so it's it's really a collaborative thing rather than a doing unto sort of profession okay yes that's interesting too 
sounds very digital. If only we could plug all that into some digital tools and techniques and uh, resources. Yeah, I'm, I'm We could transform to... the whole world, I'm sure. But what, well, hang on. Well, we could. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that's only one of a, a number of, uh, ex, uh, of things sort of outside o, OT that is, uh, would, would make huge and naive claims about the huge improvements that could be made. I mean, in your experience, how, uh, is the OT service, as far as you inter as far as you provide it or interact with it, is is it moving towards taking on digital options for people to do stuff? Because I mean, all of those things that you mentioned, probably there are digital. Yeah, know, I mean, I, I suppose. I mean, for me, I've been. I think I've been qualified thirty years. Um, <gasps> and yeah, terrifying. And. Um, I think I think it's always been quite challenging. So I suppose when uh, you know early on, um, you were looking at very specialist providers. So if you had somebody who needed, you know, if you had say a quadriplegic who needed, you know, I mean, I can remember seeing people with very early eye gaze technology, um, but that was all provided through specialist centres. So. Um, environmental control provision was an assessed service and I mean those those providers still exist for sort of you know automatic door openers the ability to make telephone calls uh, you know possum steeper these kind of companies still exist and that was quite specialist and I suppose what's been challenging for everybody I think it um, is the kind of more mainstreaming of some of that technology and the fact that you can use apps or even accessibility on your own devices to make up for some of that. And is that um, something that you've, is that something that OT has focused on um, recently or? I think, I think OTs are interested in that, but I don't think, it, I don't think we're experts by any way, shape or form. And I think that- I don't think anyone is. is. I don't think no, anyone is. I, and I think the difficulty is that it moves so fast and you almost need specialists to provide advice because it's just changing all the time. Um, you know, what, what's possible and what apps are out there and trying to keep a handle on all of that is, is quite, quite difficult. Is, is there a movement within the profession to try to get to grips with this, do you think? Or is that something that... I mean, there that... certainly is some uh, digital leadership from the College of Occupational Therapy Um you know, I, I suppose, yeah, it possi I mean, I, I don't think any of us are, are, are as far advanced as we could be, really. Mm -hmm. um, I and I, I think that's a common a common thing in most professions, to be honest, over the past, it's really mm -hmm. only the past two or three years that people have even started to think about how to do this. Stuff. Yeah, and I mean, I, I you know, people are using much more mainstream devices, you know, so you do see people who, who are using, like, a, Alexa's that kind of you know to to give them some control that they wouldn't have had prior you know so the ability to um even just put on some music or turn on a light you know in the past that was very specialist technology whereas now you know it's it's much more in the mainstream and you know it's it's a big thing if you can't you know if you can't switch on and off your lights that's a big thing and how do um, people tend to um get their Alexa's route for example they, they that would be a kind of self-purchase um mm -hmm. that would be a self-purchase item but i know since um since lockdown that some of the charities are starting to look at providing almost kits to people mm -hmm. because um you know there's they're they're offering people like a MiFi dongle plus an alexa plus an ipad to kind of get them started but then I think there's that whole thing about who are the people to then support them to set all that up and that was really a challenge when nobody was supposed to be being visited yes. <laughs> so you were you were trying to keep contact yes. with somebody um but you weren't supposed to go and see them because that you know understandably put them at risk but then who was the person there to support them to set it all up um, and I, I wouldn't say that OTs necessarily, you know, they, they wouldn't necessarily be the experts in that at all, that kind of, um, so you might know what you want to, 
what somebody wants to achieve and you mm -hmm. might be able to do a bit of but it's, I think it's really really difficult because you know if you think about I don't know like voice activation software or there's so many apps there's so many apps like to dictate things for you and how do you advise somebody what the best is really tricky yeah it, 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 there's such a such a variety of, of devices whether it's phones or tablets or more specialist devices yeah. as well I mean I, I, I think I picking up from what you said there it, it seems to me that it, that um, it probably is unrealistic to expect OTs to actually do the nitty-gritty support of this digital equipment mm -hmm. but it's it, it seems to me that OTs are almost uniquely placed in being able to work out what is actually required yeah, I mean, because I think of the that breadth would... of, because of the breadth of the view that you take of somebody's life, and obviously you'll there'll be a certain uh, threshold of of need that will you know you'll presumably you have to cross to actually get access to the service. But it would seem to me that we should be listening to OTs and engaging with OTs as a profession, in terms of reducing the number of apps that are thought about or considered, and and making sure that that we can somehow make sense of that for for the OT profession as a whole to recommend within. Obviously yeah. that's all part, that obviously that's all, all, that would all need to be done through the, the Royal College or, or other professional structures or through um, the local authorities or however it was going to be done. But it seems yeah, to me that, that there's a huge, there's a huge amount of stuff that digital people struggle with, which OTs could take one look at and say, well, this is what you should do. Speak to that person, speak to them about this and agree with the client that and get on with it. Yeah, and I wonder we if... might spend days wandering around the countryside of our minds thinking about what how to approach things like that. Yeah, now I do wonder if the sort of um, environmental um, control, like the electronic assistive technology teams around the country, you know, because I know they're, they're still using a number of, um, like... Uh, apps as well as the more specialist stuff but I that there have started a group in Scotland which I've just um, said I would join because there's a girl in Forth Valley that's looking to kind of connect up services but that was more around so environmental control technology would be a, a different thing from um your sort of Wi-Fi enabled stuff, but the no, the, I was the I was thinking of I was thinking along the lines of things that you said that you know you were you were keen to make sure that people could chat with their friends, could play the guitar, could could work, yeah. could travel. It's those sorts of things that I was thinking of in, uh, from yeah. a digital point of view, uh, rather than the very basic um, safety and um, mobility stuff that that yeah. I think really the environmental stuff is more about. It is because I suppose it's a, like a little bit more robust if it's essential because you're not reliant mm -hmm. on your Wi Fi mm -hmm. signal. Um, mm -hmm. and, and the other thing is that there is a like there has been a level of reluctance among some people about actually kind of cost and whether whether they see the value of that to themselves in terms of you know buying like broadband. You know, there's you know if you if you don't really see the value then it's like why would i fork out all that money a month yeah. when i don't actually yeah. think i need it but so it you find that do you find that in other in other areas and other sort of non-digital things that you recommend do you find that level of resistance or is that something uh, kind of special to the digital stuff no i i think it probably is um I think the difficulty always is you're kind of trying to preempt things for people sometimes. So you've, you know, people have got a condition that's likely to progress. And what you would really like is that investment when people are really able to learn these things, you know, so you want, but at that point, people don't see it as essential. And when money's tight, they're like, why would I spend money on that? And then by the time they actually need it, they've almost they've gone past the point where they can access it because they should have been doing all that practice before they really needed it so I, th I think that's always a tension and perhaps we should use you know funding sources better to let people have the stuff as a preventative thing so that when it actually comes to the point that they really need it they're quite slick and maybe their therapy team would be slicker too I was, was going to ask about yes, funding, exactly. actually, <laughs> Ruth. I was going to ask about funding, Ruth. Where where do people get funding from this? Uh, is there funding available 
from charities? There's, there's ch charity funding would probably be where it comes from, yeah. So if you've got a charity, so I know that locally, um, like the Multiple Sclerosis Society where I work has provided some technology for people, but they've um, they've been able to access some of the government schemes as well to, to tap into, um, to get. So, uh, and there are people who are just funding their own bits and bobs because they see it as a, as a priority or good value mm -hmm. for money. Mm -hmm. Do you have contact, Ruth, with the uh, Access to Work service? Uh, I don't because at the moment that's not a, um, that's not a service that's being offered where I'm working currently. But I did in other jobs previously. We would work. Um, we got quite a lot of um, pieces of equipment through access to work. Because I think I think sometimes people are surprised how much they can get from access to work that they. They yeah. thought they might have to pay for themselves. I, I was talking to somebody last week um, who's got a huge range of things, including a personal assistant. Um, and I just wondered if that was, if people were using that as much now as they used to. Yeah, probably not as much as they could be. I think, I think a lot, of, I think possibly multiple sclerosis will be accessing the Connecting Scotland scheme, perhaps. They are, yeah, that's and, the, I and, think that. It, it strikes me that the, the key thing with that scheme apart from getting the right device and apart from making sure that people actually do have some bandwidth and some connect connectivity, the key thing is to choose and support within your operations as a charity or whatever, the digital champions that are part of that scheme. Yeah. I, know, I know that also the or Orkney Disability Forum um, have accessed that scheme as well. And th they've made uh, one of their drivers, the digital champion, which I think is brilliant. I've also, I also know of organisations, which I will anonymise, um, who have gone for devices and made a very senior manager their digital um, champion. And I think to myself, when is that person ever going to actually interact properly with the clients mm. to actually be an effective champion of the digital skills? I mean, it's great that they've got involved. It's, it's, I'm not criticising that particularly, but it just seems to me that the, the, the skills side is always the bit that gets least thought through. And it seems to me that that is some, somewhere where... You don't really need an, an OT could really contribute to that sort of stuff without any detailed digital knowledge, just in ter terms of common sense and good practice. I don't know what you think of that. Yeah, I mean, certainly we've been, you know, um, one of my colleagues has been trying to link into quite a lot of stuff. And I know we've been chatting with the charities, um, but I think, you know, it's really... I mean, in Orkney, where I work, they rolled out near me, which is the digital consulting. Um, so you can do remote appointments really, really quickly. And that's great. But people almost needed to practice before we were really in this situation. So, Absolutely. you know, I have, I have done some digital consults. But what I feel now, and we are starting that, is now we're permitted to go and see people again. You know, we need to kind of explore with them and make practice calls so that if we lock yes. down again or even I was at a Royal College event the other week and they were speaking about um, remote assessment and they were just saying you know even if you can do 80% of your so you do all your information gathering remotely and then you actually go and see the person for the practical thing, which you perhaps can't do remotely, then at least you've reduced your contact in that house. So rather than being in there for an hour, you might get under the 15 minutes, which they recognise make puts people at least risk. So I think part of what we all need to be doing when we're going out to people is saying, have you got some technology do you know how to use it? Maybe we can do a practice while we're here. Or the other thing that we're doing is, say, in a team where you might have had an OT, a physio, a speech and language therapist, a specialist nurse, we're trying to say, like, who really needs to go? And maybe that person goes and supports the technology or takes a laptop. Oh, what a good and idea. Then, and then everybody yes. else can dial in, you know, so we might yes. take a laptop. And I'm actually thinking in my service that we might try and buy some MiFi's for staff so that we can actually go out and we actually have a way of connecting people. Um, 
yeah that's a so, that's a great idea so that there's so idea. much there's so much stuff and the other thing is um there's like a service doing digital passports for people um and i'm really keen we try and do some digital passports so there's just so much to so much opportunity can you say more about what a digital passport is Rose? yeah so um Digital passports are being used for people with quite profound disabilities. And so um, they're almost like a digital about me. So um, they would they would have an iPad and it follows a set format and it, it would say, you know, this is me. These are the things I like. So somebody who couldn't maybe communicate rather than a caregiver or somebody else always having to say, oh, this person lights their tea black or they like sugar it would all be on your digital passport and then things like um you know uh how you move that person so you could actually video so rather than trying to write down you know you put the sling on like this and you put this loops on you would actually show that on the passport so it just reduces the risk down yeah, sounds chat. great. It sounds like a bit like um, digital IT. I did a ID. Sorry, I did a piece of work with Yachty. He's a they do a digital ID identification thing. I've got a thing hanging up on my wall, um, where you like that. You for for example, somebody seeking a DV service would be able to uh, explain all their background, so they wouldn't have to go over the the situation again and again. So it sounds yeah. like a, a, a version of that. It sounds really. It'd be really good, and because you know, there's so much risk and frustration. And I think you can't, you know, it's much easier to see something visually than it is to um, to try and read vast pieces of paper when you go into somebody's house. Like much, much easier to see. Um, and PAMIS, who are a charity, um, are actually offering support for services to do that free at the moment, whereas usually there would be a charge. Um, so we are going to try and get some done um, I found oh, an article from, 2015, uh, from 2018 on PAMIS yeah um, so that 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 is them and um, we've been in touch with them and we, we've set ourselves a target to try and get four done in my service this year because yeah. um, once once we've done some I think then then you kind of know how to do it mm -hmm. um, and there's been a you know there's all sorts of there's always issues around data protection and all these kind um but actually a digital passport belongs to the individual so it's yeah. their data yes and it's there with them and they choose who to show it to presumably well, that's, they this is exactly what i was going to say yeah yeah they choose they're in charge they're totally in charge mm -hmm. really a nice thing well no that's all that's all really great um I, it's it's just I, I just hope that we, we, we can make the most of the OT perspective in all of this digital uh, connectivity stuff, because even more than before we chatted, it's, it's clear to me that, that um, the general approach to service provision that OTs take is precisely what digital organisations should be doing in providing um, services digitally to, 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 to anybody, really. Um, mm. And um, I just hope that we can, we can uh, keep these things in touch with each other and that the and that the college for for o ot's progresses well and that as well as actually using stuff for consultations and so on that you were talking about there that the actual the rate the range of digital possibilities for people to do stuff to maximize their occupations can just be properly taken as as, as time goes by but i i think i think that one thing that i've taken away from what you've said is is that the sheer number and complexity of the marketplace of digital stuff is an issue and it somehow, is an issue i think it's we, almost it's almost paralyzing because there's too much yeah. choice and you and almost somehow, need somebody just to say okay if this is the issue we recommend these five apps or if yeah. this is your issue we uh, you know or if this is the problem with the interface we recommend you know this interface um, you know, because there's so much, you know, there's so much inherently in your device that's accessible. Um, and I know Ability Net's helped us a bit with that, you know, so that people who can't type any longer to use their voice activation. Um, but I, I, I think you do need somebody just to kind of almost say, 
right, here's your here's your flow chart for this. You know, if this is your problem, select this, if, you know, because yeah. there's just so many options. And mm. I don't think OTs in amongst the range of everything else they're trying to do on a daily basis could kind of be doing that, really. I think there are some of, excellent... We need, oh, we, go on, Swain. We need to kind of crystallise some of that as just accepted good practice and then keep it up to date somehow or other. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's interesting. It's interesting. There are some there are some great organizations out there trying to trying to help with that. Like Digital Unite, for example, they've got something like 400 technology guides on their website. Simple, right. simple guides to help people kind of work through various things. And also cast um to Catalyst, which is their um that brings together a number of organizations in the technical goods space, are looking at you know what people need directly and in fact one of the stories we're going to talk about in a bit is about how to help people online because sometimes you know those of us who have a bit of technical knowledge will wade in going oh do blah 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 and it's like that's not what i asked you how do i switch this machine on that's what i want to know i don't want to know anything yeah. else just that um so yeah. we can sometimes be a bit too keen and i know i've i mean we've used some ability net guides for like um for some things um, so yeah, I mean it's just good, and probably that's something that OTs could know more about is even just where that information is. It's something that we could maybe take up as a local authority through the digital office for local government, because there's all there's OTs. I think OTs are in every local authority, a part of every local authority service. Would that be fair? Yeah, no. Absolutely. Whether but whether through whether through joint health things or otherwise, and it yeah. it, it would be some it's something that I think that. That nationally at a Scottish level anyway that, that we could maybe make some progress on e even nope. if we just were able to recognise people who were doing some of this work anyway and who might make it available to the rest of us. No that would be good it's, it's suddenly got very very wild here <laughs> <laughs> and you've lost your camera <laughs> well I'll tell you what we'll say thank it's you Ruth and let you go and batten down your caravan <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's been really, really interesting, and and I hope we can, I hope we can even locally just take it forward a wee bit over the weeks and months that come. But anyway, um, I hope and I hope that it's been of interest to others watching. So thank you very much indeed, Ruth. Thank Thanks you. for joining us. Thank you. Great. Bye. 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 <laughs> great. I learned a lot. Yes. No. It's good. I. I. Yeah. That was. I think the. the it's what I said. The basic OT attitude and way of doing things it's just tailor-made for um digital really mm -hmm. all the things yeah. that you would want to do yeah well even even just saying um that the uh, you know most people take uh the ot part as as meaning what you do for work when in fact it's for as a whole life thing which is uh worth really worth repeating that uh, you know I, I resume you can um access these services you know anybody in, in life whether they're working or not so um oh absolutely i mean occupation as ruth said it doesn't mean what you do for a living it means anything that you do in your life whether mm -hmm. for recreation or health or mm -hmm. work or whatever it means all yeah. those things yeah so, and the yeah. access to work thing um uh, for those of people who don't know is is from the employment service so it is if you're working but you can get you know substantial help um, still from the government uh, if you need if you if you're written in it strikes me that, all, that the digital inclusion projects sh should probably always consider getting some kind of ot input early on just to look at what they're trying to get done yeah i think that, that if, if nothing else were to happen over the, in the short term that would be quite a good idea because mm. of anybody who will understand what the generality of people with occupational in the widest sense problems are it's going to be mm. the occupational therapy yeah. service yeah and if there's one thing that the digital people sometimes struggle with, it's proper insight into what's actually required and what the design would look like for those requirements. So, mm. Yeah, I think it's one of the reasons why I love go to hacks, because you meet people from different backgrounds. And it sounds like I mean, I've never met an OT at a hack, but, you know, I would encourage mm -hmm. them to go and encourage people to recruit them for hacks. Um, so you can have that that perspective. Similarly, I would encourage you know using community workers for example because they also have have a lot to offer and so you can it's it's yes. a kind of the support for the, the kind of multi multi disciplinary team really that, that you know not one person can have of all the of it's all very the easy for it people to reinvent very badly things that people actually know about and they could learn about directly from those people 
<laughs> as we know. <laughs> yes. Okay, so we picked up a few other stories uh, during the week, and um, so one of them is from the BBC. Uh, shopping around is impossible when you don't have the computer. Well, we we're pretty familiar with that as a, as a concept. Um, and uh, there was a survey done by Citizens Advice that actually said that eight in 10 people were still paying some kind of loyalty penalty because they didn't have um, access to a computer to be able to, uh, you know, to shop around and see what, what else is available. And for some, that may only result in spending a few pounds a year more than they need to, but for others, it could make a huge difference. And um, I don't know about you, Swain, but I've, I've never switched, but I, I, you know, it can be difficult. Um, but the government-backed money and pension service has some tips for con consumers, uh, and these include haggling on deals such as broadband contracts uh, to find out what's it, what's been offered elsewhere, where, and then and then have a chat with your provider to say, you know, I'm thinking of leaving, what, what you know, because I can get a better service elsewhere. Um, and you ask, apparently the the tip is the trick is to ask to be put through through a retention or disconnection team, as they tend to. Uh, be more conscious that uh, you know of not wanting to lose customers. Um, another tip is that um, a pay-as-you-go mobile phone does not require a credit check. So if you have a credit history that's less than perfect, um, that could be a better option uh, for you. Uh, third tip is that the uh, mobile phone handset makes the biggest difference to your bill. So if you're happy with your handset or you can buy one separately, um, you should consider switching to a SIM only deal. So you, you're not tied into a, to, to, the, to one provider. And then the fourth tip on that list is um, on checking insurance to check more than one price comparison, comparison website because they're not all covered. They don't cover all the uh, same companies. You work out what covers required and check if choosing home and contents insurance from the same provider is cheap because I know we sometimes go with the, the same provider for everything. Um, but only because we've been through uh, and checked that they are they are similar, not not because we're you know haven't got time to check those sort of things. If you are going to save yourself, you know, money, a couple of hundred sometimes, then I think it's worth doing that. Have you ever yeah. used one of those? Um, have you done switching? So I have every now and again, I've had a, I have an enthusiastic month when I switch everything in sight, and uh, <laughs> then three or four years go by, and then I do it all over again. I'm usually quite good with my phone contract. Uh, not so good with car insurance or home insurance, I'm afraid to say. Um, and really, I, I, almost, I every time I, I, re, I personally I resent the time that's required to do this, but uh, it's undeniable that if you do shop around in all those ways that you just mentioned, then then you will save money. There's no question mm. about it. Mm. Yeah. Well, it sounds like the sort of thing we should be encouraging community people to do to help. People, I mean, now, now is probably the time. If you have, if you know at the time we are locked down, we're still kind of in local lockdowns to encourage people to look at saving a bit of money. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, and then I'll, I'll move on to our next story, which is um, from the Care Leavers National Movement, who have a petition to keep care leavers uh, digitally connected. And um, this is uh, the digital, a digital, the digital poverty campaign has attracted the attention of the House of Lords, and Lord Hunt is asking the government about. Um, digital access for care leavers. Uh, apparently the digital divide between care leavers and the rest of the society, society is growing and they're at risk of not being able to prosper in life due to the lack of support provided by their corporate parent to stay digitally connected when moving to independent living. So the petition calls on government to extend and improve uptake of the government scheme that provide, provides digital devices and internet for care leavers uh, to ensure every care leaver in England, England only at the moment, has a digital device and internet access for at least 12 months when they first live independently and recommend that all local offers for care leavers include the right to a digital device and internet access. Well, that certainly sounds like something we could um, support. Absolutely. You know, it seems pretty it sensible. It seems completely obvious and should be done. Mm, yeah. What age, what care leavers, is that 17, 18? Care leavers, they would be 18, I think, nowadays. Mm. Um, mm. It used to be 16, uh, I think. I, and and there are there are slightly better transition services available for eighteen year olds as well than there used to be. You know, you used to hear horror stories of people just being discharged from care at eighteen and left to fend for themselves. Hmm. I don't think it's quite so much like that anymore. But funding hmm. is very tight for that as well as for everything else because it's a locally provided service. Um, and there will be variations, I'm sure, across well, not just between parts of England but between England, Scotland, Northern Ireland, and Wales as well. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, so, but I think as a, as a specific bit of what we could all do as, well, typically corporate parents are local authorities and we mm. all elect them. So in a sense, we're all responsible for the corporate parenthood mm -hmm. of uh, care experienced people. And it seems to me that it's complete, completely obvious that this is some, the sort of thing that should should happen to um, to allow those young people to, to kind of grow into adulthood in a, in a mm -hmm. sensible and less disadvantaged way than, than is probably the case at the moment. Yeah, I mean, they, they use the phrase uh, moving to independent living, and you would think that's a, that, that really lends itself to, you know, making sure that you're connected. There's uh, been a lot of work done on that move towards um, independent living over the last maybe up to about 10 years, a lot of work done in, in the care sector. I mean, I'm sure there's huge areas where the system still needs to be reformed and improved, but I think this would be a big step um, mm. if, if everyone who was leaving care was able to access a, a, a package of stuff like this. I think that would be a big step. Mm. Good. Okay, we're moving Somebody on. Signed to it story. while we were speaking. It's gone up to nine hundred and four. <laughs> Excellent. Yes, I think we can recommend that to our uh, friends and neighbours. Um, so we're moving on to a story about the Ofcom Communications Market Report of twenty twenty. And this is an annual report that Ofcom issues, and annually our friend Dan Slee uh, covers it on his blog post. Hi, Dan. Good to make it. Got to give you a shout out. Um, and this is uh, it's a it's a good it's worth reading a, a good long blog post, but it's um, some some of the findings are that uh, the internet is still isn't evenly distributed, and if anyone doubted that, we, we can certainly agree with that on this program. Um, Dan Dan's uh, findings is that a heart to shift he calls them thirteen percent refused to use the internet, and this is a figure that hasn't changed for three years. I didn't realize. Yeah. It's been three years since, and it, when, and you know, I would imagine there will be some changes between this year's report and next year's because, uh, you know, people will have will uh, be be using it. But um, yeah, we, it'll be keen. It'll be interesting to see what the reasons are for the thirteen percent refusal. Um, Ninety-seven percent of the UK's properties are covered by four G, uh, but only sixty uh, sixty-seven percent of its geography is so in Scotland and Wales that's especially patchy so that that will uh, appeal to you or you know appeal to you in the wrong way I suppose uh, Swain but you know it's yes it doesn't we, seem uh, right it's an ongoing it's an ongoing issue 25 year old issue since 2G came along that the, the places that in some cases arguably could make best use of the technology just don't have access to it because it's not provided mm -hmm. yeah doesn't seem right um, but then those, anyway, those moving on, those who uh, do use the internet do so extensively. And we're now at three hours, 29 minutes use a day on average. Three hours, 29, I'd say I'm probably well over that way. And I keep it. Yes, I think I am too, even before I was working from home. Yeah. I keep a, a tab on my um, mobile now. And that's just my, you know, what I use my mobile for. But I have a, a tablet, a laptop and the, de the desktop that I'm on now. And I'm, I'm on them, you know you know several hours a day easily i don't know if they add it if they kind of just count the time i suppose they just count the time that you're on but mm. you know i'm on two devices here anyway as a minimum yes. how many devices are you on there oh three at least mm. well yes three phone work laptop and yeah. uh, this one yeah i remember going to events where people had more than one device and i was like oh you know this is just <laughs> you know too far into the future but now you just take it for granted don't you we've talked I think before finland about how you take was the several first devices i think finland was the first country in the world to have more mobile phones than population right and that was a long time ago now it's about 2002 2003 time well now that esco reinekainen has moved back there i'm sure that's, that's uh, <laughs> increased <laughs> exponentially <laughs> um yeah so uh dan in dan's report he says uh, as you might have guessed 18 to 24 year olds are leading the way online and they're connected in his in his figures, the Ofcom figures, just over five hours a day. But um, 25 to 34 year olds and 35 to 44 year olds, neither of which I am, uh, both spend more than five hours and even 45 to 54 year olds, that's more like it, are on for three and three quarter hours daily. So I think, you know, it's not it's not an age um, age related so much. Um, so even before I'd say lockdown was was completely covered in this report, um, you know, people of, of our age, shall we say, Swain, 
Our, yes. um, our certainly... well, I'm looking at the three hour bracket next year, so you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> so yeah, that's the over 55 year olds, no slouches in online spending, just uh, short of three hours a day online. And I'm sure that's increased. And I, you know, my own mom, again, as my, my kind of touch point on this, uh, often on this program, um, she, she's checking her iPad every day, you know, Facebook, an hour maybe and that's i'd say it's not unusual for for her and her age group um she still calls uh any video call a skype but um well you know, she's, i she's still call any them. vacuum cleaner a hoover so that's all, <laughs> that's all right yeah <laughs> so it's good to it's good to have that kind of data um and uh, and to know that somebody is kind of keeping an, an eye on it. Oh, it's, a, it's an excellent it's an excellent thing that Dan does every year. And every year I say I must delve into the detail of the report. And then every year a year passes and here's Dan's blog again, and I haven't yeah. even looked at the report. But uh, I know I know, he, I know I know he recommends that we all spend at least five or six hours delving into the actual report he itself. Does. Yeah. So it's only fair to uh, mention that and to encourage ourselves and others to, to actually do that, as Dan suggests. Yeah, I see from the headline on your screen, it says, goodbye, Twitter, you were fun. Yes, it, it's true that Twitter isn't as much used as uh, as every other social platform anymore. Uh, I mean, there's what two billion users on Facebook and and, uh, and and Twitter's only in the hundred millions now, I think. So it's uh, it's not as popular as it once was. But those of us who use it uh, still, still like it. Oh, you got the is, figures up for. Hmm. I think Dan's point is that um, Twitter was very much the new thing when public sector first got online and into digital stuff and there's a danger that we get kind of left behind among twitter when most of the people that we're serving have moved on to other things mm. so the whole i think his point is that we just have to keep evolving which platforms we use and honing techniques to use them effectively mm, absolutely For example he's saying don't get your don't get your middle management to do tiktok videos get local young people to do tiktok videos giving giving out messages from your local middle managers yes where it where wearing, wearing the scarf yeah. of your local uh, football team or whatever to, yeah to absolutely personalize it <laughs> <laughs> there's a list there of the uk social media users 2020 uh, 2020 and uh, for for our listeners in on hope radio uh, we'll read out some of the top ones so facebook is 43.9 million youtube 43.4 million and messenger 43.4 million so that's adding uh, Facebook owns Messenger as well and WhatsApp. So and 30.2 million on WhatsApp. So, you know, huge numbers there. Obviously, there'll be some overlap. Um, but uh, and they own Instagram as well. And that's 28.2 million. So you're looking at, mm -hmm. you know, big numbers there. And you're, so you're it's scrolling down. To see, it is. Yeah. yeah. I'm, 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 there's a diagram of the top three choices for each. Uh, age group it isn't in this, mm. in this one but um twitter twitter is not among the top three social media choice of any age group in the uk very sad I love at twitter. best it's fifth or sixth mm. yeah i mean john was a big twitter uh user as well wasn't he yes um mm. but i mean i think i think i think the thing that's really growing is Pri private spaces are the, either groups in facebook or whatsapp groups or yeah. things like that people are yeah. mo much m less willing to just broadcast their views to everybody in the world mm. and you can see why when levels of abuse are so high and when mm. you know people might want to discuss things that they don't want to make absolutely public yeah and going back to that one about switching switching services it's in the local uh, neighborhood groups that people are going to say, well, I'm thinking of switching to, to whatever. What do you think? And that's, and that's, right. what, that's what people get the recommendations Absolutely. down. That's what they make decisions on. Mm. Yeah. You know, it used to be my dad was a great uh, believer in the witch magazine, the consumer magazine mm -hmm. uh, for recommendations, but they're just not able to keep up with no. local recommendations. No. Right. So, you know, we can all benefit from them in, some, in various ways, as long as we check our facts. <laughs> Make sure okay, the sources so the are reliable. Story, yes. Absolutely. Check your sources. Um, the next story is how to be helpful online. I, I, I really like this one. I've talked about it a couple of times since I saw it. Um, and this is by someone called Ned Batchelder, um, uh, you know, talking about how, how to ask good questions. And as an information professional, uh, we when I was learning uh, 
uh, you know, to, to be that. It was about doing a good reference interview, you know, asking questions. So when someone comes into your information service and says, you know, well, I know, I know it had a red cover or no, I know I want to, you know, look after cats. Um, you kind of have to probe a bit more and, and eventually you might find out that they want to run a business, you know, uh, and so then you need to advise them differently. And so uh, this, this story is a bit like that, um, where we're kind of talking about asking good questions to help people online. Um, so this piece um, hopefully will be useful to the people we're hoping to help uh, on this program, aimed at the helpers, not the askers. So it looks, it sees us helpers as the experts, hopefully we are in some places, and the regulars, constants in the, help, in the help forums and how we behave sets the tone for everyone. So we can't expect to fix the askers, but we can fix or improve what the, what the helpers do. And he, and he does acknowledge that helping people online isn't easy that people don't know, always know how to ask or interpret our answers, or maybe English isn't their first language. Um, we don't know what they know. And it's one of the things that Ruth, Ruth comment, but I, um, hinted at as well, during lockdown, it's even harder because you're not allowed to be beside them. Yeah, yeah. So you can't you can't lean over their shoulder and kind of point to the screen and say, move, move your cursor there or something like that. So yeah, I think Paul Flayton would have ideas about that as well, because he's still obviously helping lots of people even uh, during lockdown. Um, but I think you know, this is a really good, a really good uh, piece that kind of goes through step by step about what you know what not to do. You know, don't pile on to people. Don't you know, hundreds of people don't have to have to answer a question. Um, and uh, can you make it any bigger on your screen there, Swain? Yes, I can. I think. I mean, some of the some of the conversations are a bit technical about Python and stuff like that, but you know. Yeah, so I think that, I think what he's talking about is providing uh, support to software developers, but I think it's mm. directly directly transferable onto any topic, really. Yeah, yeah. I don't understand those things that he's telling you not to worry about, not not to be horrible about. There are obviously things that Python Python is a computer language. Yeah. There are obviously, techniques within the Python language that uh, are deprecated by people who think they know what they're doing. Yeah. But nevertheless, yeah. he says, even if you think the person is is trying to do something that you wouldn't do, help them. Yeah. Because it's their thing. Yeah. Not your Absolutely. thing. Absolutely. Yeah. Don't say, don't give them the answer or it wouldn't start from here. You know, yes, mm. go with them, work with them. Um, and then under the dogpiling uh, subtitle there, it says, you know, if you're, if you're already being helping and it's getting frustrating, let someone else take over. You know, you're not the only person who can answer a question in the world. So allow somebody else to uh, take over and you know, maybe work differently with the person. Can you move down the article a little bit, Swain? Yeah, say yes. So yeah, that's that's a great, this one's a great response. Say yes as much as possible. Answer with yes answers instead of no answers. So when someone asks, you know, is this the way to Amarillo? You say, um, you don't say that this is not uh, the way to Amarillo. You say, well, it is, um, but you might need to take a detour at the next junction or study, you know, be, be positive about what, the, what people are trying to do. Um, I don't know if there's much more in that in that article to, to get from. Step back, yeah, take some blame. Yeah, just yeah, admit, admit sometimes that you mightn't have got it completely right. Use more words, sounds very good. Understand your motivations. Well, we're, we're being motivated here to help get more people online um, and have humility. Oh, I like that one. So mm -hmm. something I find sometimes. Hard. I'm not sure I should. I'm not sure I should follow the advice to use more words. To be perfectly honest, I, think I use plenty of words. <laughs> use less use more words. meaningful <laughs> words might be better. Um, it's this is the, the humility one is is nice because it reminds me of um, what we hear in uh, social media surgeries about the social glow. You know the kind of give the, the glow it gives you from helping somebody. Um, but it just feels good to be able to help somebody else and make connections. And the final the final part of this uh, piece is to say, is say it's hard, you know, some people aren't ready to be helped. We can't fix everything, um, but we can try to be helpful helpers. I think that's a good Yeah, good th th this is this on. is advice to people who are trying who are trying to give help over a text based chat system uh, to people who are trying to do technical things. But I, I really think it's a fantastic article because all the headings apply to anything, any digital advice that anyone's trying to give to anybody about anything. <laughs> So it's, it's, it's a really, really good um, summary, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, and one that would not, be, would not be unfamiliar to the way that OTs do their work with mm. helping people in the community. And, and yeah. really, there's only a certain limited number of right ways to do anything, and, and they tend to share huge overlaps. So we can mm. always learn from good practice in another field. Definitely. 
So our last story uh, today is about um, deaf people in the UK. And this is a story actually from BT from last year, but I, I, I don't think that it will have changed that much. Uh, the headline here was that 8.4 million deaf people in the UK can't make calls to businesses independently. Um, so that's 70% of the deaf community have to ask friends or family members for help with basic calls. Uh, this is despite the rise in digital technology such as web chat and so social media. Um, phone calls may remain an essential form of communication for 80% of the deaf community, with 46 people, 46% of the community calling businesses at least once a week. Um, but apparently their uh, experience, uh, such as booking appointments, paying bills or purchasing products and services is poor. Uh, with certain services, um, they give examples uh, such as healthcare and banking inaccessible for a quarter of the deaf community, which doesn't sound very positive at all. Um, the uh, what was called the Next Generation Tech Service provider of BT has been rebranded to Relay UK, and this service, uh, which is Ofcom regulated, uh, translates text to speech and vice versa. Um, apparently, the new app offers improved customer experience and new functionality. Um, and the, um, the user can connect to a call by selecting one of three options, type and read, speak and read, or type and hear. So um, I, hope that, I hope that this service uh, you know, is now well bedded in and people are finding it useful. I, uh, I haven't had that much to do with um, people with hearing loss recently, um, but it sounds like, again, it's one of those uh, groups uh, that we're hoping to help um, and it'd be great to have somebody on who has more experience of this that we can we can ask questions of. There may be somebody in our networks we could talk mm -hmm. to. Yeah. Mm. I, yes, I was noticing that the RNID has changed their name back to RNID from help with hearing loss or something. Okay. For reasons, I don't know. It's not related to this story particularly. Mm. Um, no, but that really UK thing, I mean, there's the step-by-step -step instructions there on, on what is a BT website describing a BT service. Um, therefore, getting it installed on your phone or your iPad. So uh, hopefully that will be of some use to to people who might need that. Yeah, there certainly are more uh, strides being made in helping people with hearing impairment or people who use sign language as a, as their communication uh, language uh, than there used to be. I mean, I've been I was at an exhibition last year where there were more than one um, service where somebody could uh you know uh, connect using video probably um and have a sign language interpreted conversation with somebody else um in a much more convenient way than, than has been previously but it's i'm sure there's still work to be done and it's um uh, hopefully not being uh held back by uh the fact that we're you know we're in lockdown in some places i'd like i'd like to hear more about that i will probably look into it um, so that's all the stories from this week. One, one of the things I did come across um, this week was a talk we were both at, I think, Swain, as part of, oh yeah, what was it? Oh yeah, local government, local, local, local golf camp, camp with the wonderful Nick Hill. Um, yeah, I mean, he did, that was an amazing. Uh, Great week. An, and again, one of these annual annual events, but it's because they've done it, is that the second time they've done it this year already? Ooh, I Did they know. do something earlier on? Mm -hmm. Anyway, it was great to, it was great local to have Local Government North coming up later. Okay. So this was last week, and it was a talk about um, working with citizens in the community, getting people online, and it was um, uh, specifically talking to citizens online in Brighton and Hove, who've done some really excellent work locally. Um, and they did. They had a slide um, about getting online. That kind of I've got it. I've got it here, and I'm going to tweet it out later. Um, that kind of takes people through the, the, the various steps um, of getting online. And I, I really like guides that, you know, do, they don't assume anything. They assume very little knowledge and uh, help people to get online much more easily. So I think we're uh, ready. No, that's to all good. I think we're just about at the end. Show. Show. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so I will say goodbye from me. And goodbye from me. Thanks very much. And we have our guests next week, hopefully, Claire White from WEA. So we look forward to that.